Ladies and gentlemen, it's Diamond from the Oppenheimer Ranch Project and Magnetic Reversal News. And look at who is on the screen touching his mustache. Yes, it's true. It's Matt Powers, the permaculturestudent.com, <laughs> the permaculture guru. Actually, the musician. I mean, we're talking professional musician turned awesome dude to save the planet, Matt Powers. Hours of powers with Matt. Let's meet him. He's an author, an educator, an entrepreneur focused on radically transforming the K through 12 experience for children everywhere by aligning their education with current regenerative science. Wow, that sounds revolutionary. What, I mean, you're awesome, bro. Um, if you don't know about Matt, check out the permaculturestudent.com. And he also has an awesome Facebook page and YouTube page. You have a Facebook page, don't you, Matt? Absolutely. Cool. I don't have that up here, but I'll link it below. It's a after we... student. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so he also has an awesome YouTube channel, Matt Powers, the permaculture student. There'll be links below. Let's get him up to 8,000 subscribers tonight. Uh, and without further ado, let me, well, uh, let's welcome Matt. How the heck are you? I'm amazing. Thank you so much for having me on. This is, uh, I, I feel like, I feel like everything's heating up right now. Your show, all these shows that are on YouTube that are spreading real regenerative truth, real regenerative science, people are waking up and getting really excited about the possibilities. Now, isn't it? I find so it you. amazing <laughs> that permaculture has been around since the early 70s. And I grew up in Pennsylvania uh, right by the, uh, uh, what is it, the, the Rodale Institute, which has been cutting edge doing organic farming uh, education and experimentation for decades, the Rodale Institute. I know all those people up there. Um, Paul Stamets and, you know, the world of fungi. I mean, these are, this is information we've had for decades. And I thought uh, back in the day it would all explode and no one gave a crap. And now, it, thankfully, it's coming back. All the old stuff is coming back and, and younger people want to do it. Everybody's doing it. You're doing it. Yeah, actually, it was crazy because when I started practicing this stuff, it was just for me and my family, you know, to get good food, to try to live a healthier life. But then all my students, I was a high school teacher at the time, and all my students were like, wait, what are you doing? And then I would explain why I was doing it and then explain the real life examples and it would just fly in the face of what they're hearing on the news and you know what I mean? And so it would just foment this endless curiosity and, and then I just ended up sharing and explaining and just shifted kind of what I was teaching from English and music to permaculture, regenerative living and, uh, and even a little bit of cooking. <laughs> Now, before we get started uh, to talk about permaculture, because it's one of my passions, and I know it's one of your passions, uh, let's just define it for the audience. Permaculture is a set of design principles centered around whole systems thinking, simulating or directly utilizing the patterns and resilient features observed in natural ecosystems. And if that is a mouthful, it means... Walk out into the woods, check out what's going on, and replicate that in your yard. And that's basically, uh, do you want to add anything to that, Matt? Yeah, when I talk about it with kids, I say it's looking at the world through the lenses of Mother Nature. So you're just seeing the world as if you were nature. And so you're like, oh, well, we would have to have our waste feed back into the soil if we were just like all the other animals. You know what I mean? And so you suddenly start seeing how we don't make any sense at all with most of our processes. So, yeah, it's a lens is how I see it. Now, what I have up on the screen is uh, the permaculture principles, the 12 principles. I'm sure you're familiar with them. And let me just uh, show you the this version here. <clears throat> and we can quickly discuss them. I will read them to the audience through them. And then maybe you can pick one or two of the principles that we can discuss in terms of how to utilize it in your daily life. So the 12 principles are one, observe and interact. Number two, catch and store energy. Number three, obtain a yield. 
Now, for us people in Colorado, we love to obtain a yield. Now, four, apply self-regulation and accept feedback. That means don't be a prick. Number five, use and value renewable resources <laughs> and services. You know, recycle for God's sakes. Number six, produce no waste unless you're pooping and then put that in the garden. Number seven, design from patterns to details or patterns in nature. Number eight, integrate rather than segregate. Nine, use small and slow solutions. I love that. Number 10, use and value diversity. Something we don't do on planet Earth. 11, use the edges, value the marginal. This is very important, especially if you're trying to bring a forest biome into like a devoid uh, field or something. You want to be bringing that system in from the margin. And the final one, 12, creatively use and respond to change. I love each and every one of these. We could talk an hour on any of them. Uh, which one do you want to talk about? I think I want to talk about edges, but before I begin, I just want to say that these are David Holmgren's 12 principles from, I think, his 2006 book. There are different principles and many more. If you look at Bill Mollison's, he's the co-creator. Co They're co-creators together. Um, David was a student. Bill was a professor. And together, they actually created the idea when, when David was like a, a genius. Seven, he's still a genius, but he was like a 17-year-old boy. So, a um, young man, you know what I mean? Like, it's just wild that this is, came from that relationship. So, um, and I also say care of future um, instead of fair share in the way I do it because it encapsulates all those things without the knee-jerk reaction to who's going to enforce fair share and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but just to, <laughs> I know, I, I dive into the language. I'm an English teacher, right? So I really, really like using the edges because when we look at the concept in nature, it's these edge species. So you've got like the ocean and you've got the land and then you've got the shore where all this stuff is meeting and you've got all these edges and it's actually where the most richness is. You go out into the middle of the ocean, you might see something, but it's not like the coast where the edge of the ocean is just so full of life, so full of richness. And meanwhile, you've got all this interaction. That's why we're always drawn to the, that edge. And so there's this magnification, there's this exponential ri rise in the amount of biodiversity present and the amount of reactions, the amount of interactions, the amount of cycling that happens at these spaces. So we could bring this down to a fence line about how it attaches things in the fence line and has all these extra relationships. Birds perch on the fence line and drop manure. All these things happen at edges, but then we can even walk it over here into the social, into our daily lives. Where are the edges of our understanding? Where are the edges of our social groups, of our communities? Who is the edge species between us and that other group or those people that we want to meet um, or those people that we don't know anything about. All these, these edge species, I'm, I'm an edge species. I'm one of those kids that uh, never was like in a crowd in high school, never was in a click. And I like would float from click to click and I'd be like a part-time character in everyone's social scene. And so I was in an edge species and that's probably why I feel really comfortable talking to anyone. Um, you can, you know, throw me in the middle of Harlem. You could throw me in the middle of Fresno, middle of LA. I'm going to be, be able to re relate to people. You know, I taught, I subbed at any school in the sixth most violent County in America. And I went to the juvenile, like, like work farm, you know what I mean? So I'm going to find ways to relate to you. I want to talk to you. <laughs> So I'm an edge species. And so I really feel empower like empowerment comes from recognizing edges, from exploring edges, and from really celebrating those. And then that dovetails with the value diversity on that principle beforehand. But yeah, no, these are super fun and you can play with them. Obviously, like language wise, produce no waste. I have a mycology friend, Peter McCoy, who wrote Radical Mycology. He likes to say there is no such thing as waste. You know, if you're not properly cycling your waste, you create pollution. 
But the, the reality is like a waste in our minds is actually gifts to the next part of the cycle. So I know, yeah, we, we, all, we all have human newer, right? And we're like, oh, we got to get rid of this stuff. It's so toxic, run away. But the reality is if it's actually prepared properly, if it's actually, we're eating really good food, we're actually giving a gift to the microbiology in that compost tea in, in the soil. And so it's really about flipping a lot of the ways that we think about this. So it's like produce no waste in your mind as well, right? Right. <laughs> well, even in the humanor aspect, uh, we could be taking uh, entire cities of people eating crappy GMO foods and be using that particular humanor for orchards. Uh, because uh, the toxins are not taken up into the fruits. We just couldn't use it for uh, actual le leafy greens and stuff like or that. Or timber. Yeah. Yeah, yeah or, or, or bamboo. Or we could hit it with EM and all those bad things can then be tied up into colloids. Like, there's a lot of new processes that we're just getting into. I mean, uh, it was only like a year and a half ago that I learned about cellulase and, and uh, chitinase. So you can just literally spray vermicompost with, that you made with um, insect frass in it. You can just spray it on the insects and it melts them. So your bark beetle problem that's taking over, we can actually just nip that in the bud and have the forest be beautiful again. But we need to actually adopt the science. We need to actually do something instead of just to have our bureaucratic arguments and pa paper pushing. Yeah, indeed. And, and something mm -hmm. people can start doing right now, <laughs> uh, which I've been doing here uh, for four years, is creating my own land race annual vegetables. We have a Bloomsdale spinach, which I started from just a packet, you know, a, a regular packet three years ago that now grows these like 11 inch leaves through the winter up through the mulch. Uh, yeah. So, and, and, and land race is simply seed saving in your region year after year after year until you get the most, what do you got there? <laughs> this is my land race amaranth. This is the one I did all those. Uh, my biggest video is on uh, land race amaranth and, and we're on, we're in the same, same boat. I love it. Yeah, we grew, uh, we grew okay. Love Lies Bleeding Amaranth here, and I sent it out to over 300 of our subscribers uh, over, uh, in the spring. So they're all growing that right now. That is the way to do it. And the thing is, that's the seeds, they want to just grow, and they want to just go one to a thousand every single time. So there's no way that you can really, like, control and, like, I mean, as soon as you share it with someone, it just exponentially grows and becomes this abundance and this wealth. My son was going through my seeds yesterday, all the seed bins that were out and everything because we're preparing for, to, to plant because we just moved into this new location. And he was like, I wish these were money because we'd be wealthy. We'd be rich. And I'm like, well, we are. <laughs> I mean, look at it. This is wealth. It's like the seeds are the legitimate wealth and the land race seeds are like the hundred dollar bills. You know what I mean? Meanwhile, everything that you buy in a store is all like one to $2, $5, you know what I mean? Bills. Um, it's that stuff that you've done yourself that, that you put years into. That's the stuff that's going to surprise you. That's going to give you the deep nutrition. Now let's talk about this awesome video. That's one of your top videos, the growing the m mighty orange giant amaranth. I watched that. It was awesome. You're like a, you're like jumping all around. There's the seed right there. Um, let can you tell us the story? How big was the first one? And then how did you get it to grow 14 feet high? Yeah. So it was really crazy because I did never grown amaranth before. I got it from Baker Creek uh, heirloom seeds and I planted only two seeds. I have the original packet of seeds still. This is how crazy this whole thing is. Meanwhile, I've got over a thousand, maybe two thousand, maybe three thousand people because I've been giving away these seeds for six years now. And so this I planted it. And the first year I just saved a half cup of seeds from the one surviving plant. I had two plants. The first one died. The second one, half cup of seeds. It was incredible. I was like, this is the most seediest plant ever. And then the next year I grew out like uh, 
I th- I think the next year is the year that you see on video. I think that might be the next year. And if it's not the next year, it, th- there's one year between it only. But basically what I did was I focused on my soil. That's what I really am. You know how Joel Saladin says, ah, I'm a grass farmer. I'm a soil gardener, farmer, everything. And it's like the soil and the seed. It's like those two pieces are the dynamo of action for me on any site. I go in there, I'm scratching at the soil before I look at anything. And I'm like, ooh, well, everything I'm going to do, I'm going to basically be chopping and dropping and and pushing back into the soil. I'm not going to be pulling out of the system if that if that soil is messed up. Um, So so, yeah, I I, I focus really on on the soil. And when I did that, I was doing compost teas. I was actually (laughs) putting uh, the crystals from water kefir into my compost teas. And I didn't realize that that would be having effects, but that totally has effects that I've only figured out um, uh, the potential for in, in recent years. But I was doing that and I was digesting this decomposed granite crystalline sand-like structure into dark chocolate loam in months time. And yeah, I was bringing in, you know, bunny manure and, and bedding from the goats. But it was that the biology that was able to digest those things. And you're like, wait, but decomposed granite is mineral. Yeah, because we got fungi in there. And, and like, so we had all the different components that actually could break down all the parts of the soil to make that organic matter and make the, that, those rich carbonaceous connections, make those minerals soluble. Yeah, they're eating rocket and making them soluble, you know. And so that's the reason why uh, it got so big. And yeah, I was always adding the goat manure, always adding bunny manure, um, and I was always mixing. So I was doing manure-based compost. I was doing vermicompost. I even had some moldering compost that I would mix in. And so the biodiversity, I was always trying to find all the different edges and bring them all in. And now now I'm using EM on top of all that and do bukashi and stuff like that. So I'm bringing in even more, bringing in the facultative, not just the thermophilic, aerobic, and the uh, vermicompost um, organisms, which all have unique um, capabilities for digesting different spectrums and releasing different spectrums of good things. So, um, so, so that's what I really do. And the end result is I get crazy seeds. And I also do things where I'm selective with my seed. So, uh, and my plants, I'm walking, I, I, I say it all the time. Um, where's my knife? There it is. Um, ah, I almost cut the internet. All right. So, um, but I'm always walking around and I say I garden with a knife because I'm going, I'm cutting down all the weak things. I'm cutting down the weeds and not pulling them. And the strongest things are surviving in the garden. And then I'm saving seed from the strongest of the strong. And then a few years into that, I mean, they, they, you've got the best of the best of the best of the best for your bioregion. And you end up completely in a different, you know, a completely different galaxy of awesomeness. <laughs> Man, that's a mouthful. And for the layman, basically, uh, you put all of the organic inputs that you possibly have in your region accessible to you. At the same time, you want to build the fungi and the mycelium in the soil. And you also want to add that rock dust, which is your, your, your granite over there. A lot of people buy azomite. We, we live in a valley with a river that has rock dust in the spring. So and you want those minerals present because if you have everything present – that the plant needs, the plant is going to prosper and give you the best result. And then you're going to get the best seed and, and you do it again and again and again and until you have the incredible Hulk of whatever you're growing. And I think that for me in that particular situation, I wasn't using rock dust. And you might go back and be like, Matt doesn't mention rock dust. But the reason I was able to really get away with that is because it was a dry climate. And in a lot of these drier climates, that have had nutrients in the past, they are still there and preserved in the soil really, really well. So, so I, I really think that was part of it. And then my animals were getting really good diets, so they were getting the minerals in the, in the manure. 
that's another trick is you could actually be fitting, uh, feeding the minerals to your animals and then having it in the manure um, as well. And then your animals uh, have that added benefit. And if you're milking, you have that added benefit. But, but yeah, you're absolutely correct that the rock dust is, you know, what's so crazy is that the reason rock dust is so critical is because just like big animals like us, the little animals in the soil require B12. And in the center of the B12 is cobalt. So when you're looking at the molecule, it's this like centerpiece. It's cobalt. And without cobalt, you can't build B12. So if you don't have cobalt in your soils, you got these beaten, you know, tilled up, destroyed, you know, sucked dry of all the nutrient soils, you're not going to have that cobalt present. Um, so, so you're absolutely right. I just want to add all that. <laughs> I love cobalt. Hey, hey, Matt, I want to talk about your spiritual awakening because it's a, it's a big part of my show. It's a big part of, um, you know, being woke or uh, privy to the inside information that the system is rigged. Um, you basically had a spiritual awakening. You were part of, uh, you know, the professional music scene. You told me you went up to New York, you were, you're hanging out with all these, you know, fancy people, you have all these connections and it wasn't feeding you literally, not like food, but spiritually you were, you were not complete as they say. And for me to be complete, I just have to walk outside into my garden and it completes me. So what was your spiritual awakening like? Heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right so wow i could answer this so many different ways um so i don't know if you know my whole story i was an alcoholic and i went to church for the first time with my wife and stopped drinking that day so there's like a whole backstory to that but what so that so that's like what what started it right like i stopped drinking and so that all the the glitz and the lights and things like became a little bit more garish, perhaps. Um, I was a I was the kind of person that would get two drinks because I got two hands, and so I and I had Crohn's right. So I was self medicating, and people with Crohn's who drink die quick, and I was spitting up blood. I was passing blood regularly on a daily basis. Um, I was a mess. Um, and when my wife met me, I didn't actually have a home. So she started feeding me. Um, and, and then I, and actually a little bit later, I, I was staying on a friend's couch uh, regularly, but, but like I was making a mess of my life at the same time as I was recording in electric lady studios, you know, where Weezer did the blue album. And then I was going to like, you know, the p former power station, which is now uh, Avatar, where John Lennon recorded. And I'm like in all these great places, but I'm just dying inside. I'm killing myself with alcohol. And I, I know people who do regenerative meat and they're wonderful people. They're all, you know, moderate and everything. I had none of that in me. I was like a burning fire, like fireball. Everyone thought I was a party animal. You know what I mean? I would stay up for days. Um... People say I have a lot of energy, right? Well, I was burning it up um, back in, at that point. And so I stopped drinking and I felt really good because I, I got to the point where I had no money and I kept drinking and I just was like miserable because I felt like such a jerk because I couldn't like contribute or save any money. And I just felt like this like bum. And so I felt that powerless. And so when I was able to stop drinking, it gave me this perspective, reflection. I stopped, I just stopped so many things and started just really focusing on what I wanted to do, what I wanted to be. And then as I really kind of dialed it in in the music industry and started really dialing it in and got really close and focused and, and sober, um, I, was, I was freaked out. I was really freaked out by what I was seeing. Um, and then I was just kind of, it was just painful being on the road, being, I was married, I had a little uh, a baby at home. Um, I was being like always hit on and everything. Um, and it wasn't, it was bothering me. I wasn't able to be chill about it. You know what I mean? 
Um, and so I just was, was not being resilient. I was not in a, in a place that where I could stand with strength. And so, and meanwhile, you know, I, I, I quit drinking and like people are putting me on the spot, like we're out to dinner and, and, and certain people are being like, so Matt, what's so wrong with drinking? And meanwhile, they're all drinking. There's 30 of them. And there's like, this person's like famous and I care what they think. And you know what I mean? And like, I have all these like head games going on. And I eventually was like, you know what? I don't care about what you think. I don't care about what I'm supposed to do, what I'm supposed to be. I'm just going to just find what feels right. And so it was really scary. And at the same time, my wife got cancer for the first time. Um, and it was thyroid cancer. She was 23 um, and or maybe 24. And our son was, was one years old. And, and all right, get this. Check this out. So we're like trusting of doctors. We're going along with the system. And, and then this happens. They decide to do oblate. They, they find there's, there's cancer in her throat. They have me tell her that she has cancer. The doctors don't even do the job. And then when they go to do the radiation, they come in in a suit in a box. I kid you not, my friend. They come in in a suit with a box and they're walking in like oompa loompas. Doo, 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 doo. They put it. And they're like, ho, 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 ho. and they, they open it and they run away. This is what they used to do. And, and meanwhile, it's all of our grandmas and grandpas who are doing this because it's all old people. So they don't know any better. They're just trusting. I'm hearing this. And meanwhile, my brain's going, doo, 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 because it's like I've had years of being dumbed down. And now like the, like the, the canopy's off. You know, I'm, I'm like, <sighs> this is kind of what happened when I, when I stopped drinking. Um, and they literally had her reach in. She doesn't have a suit on and take the pill. It's in the inner box that she needs to open and swallow it. And then they say, anything you touch for the next six months must be put into a separate garbage bag or we'll be able to track you from the radiation that they will flag at the waste management center because they'll be able to go down to the exactness looking at the actual radioactive isotope and know that it was you. And so it's like, okay, so wait, everything that your hand touches is radioactive for six months. What happens with all the old ladies who are on Medicaid, who are going home on the freaking bus to go home, meanwhile contaminating every single person on that bus for six months? So I got pissed. I got lit up. And I got like, ah, and so the first like five, six years of my marriage, like are basically like me coming to grips with all this stress and, and then her continuously getting cancer, us trying the, you know, the vegan Gerson thing that working pretty well and then having it come back again and then having all these nutritional mineral deficiency issues and so many different problems. And all, it, it just kept pushing us back to taking responsibility to doing it all ourselves. And so I just started studying organic gardening. And then I found that there was a lot of wives, you know, you know, you know, like, uh, like old, old uh, myths, you know what I mean? Like uh, just stuff that we were passed on down by the ages. And there wasn't actually any scientific evidence. And so I'm not going to waste my time when I've only got this little bit here and this little bit here between my work day to take care of my wife and kids on something that is just like Rupert Steiner's like gathered all this information. And meanwhile, if you read the original documents, you're like, wait a second, that contradicted, you know what I mean? And he, all he did was gather the information that was dying off at a time period when organic agriculture, all the different cultures, different versions of it all over the place were dying out because chemical ag was coming in. So I was like, okay, organic agriculture is part of this whole panoply of traditions. And so I was like, I need to find out what, what tests are true, what things are. And so I started studying um, Carol Depp. Do you know Carol Depp? She's great. I started studying uh, Sepp Holzer, Masanubu Fukuoka. And then I found permaculture because all those people are, are referenced by permaculturists. And then I started growing our own food um, and, 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 
and it got really crazy really fast. I basically started saving seed because I couldn't afford it. Um, and then I started doing things that apparently weren't possible with saving seeds. So I saved uh, like uh, this purple speckled Peruvian corn that's not supposed to be grown in America, apparently. It's impossible. I didn't know it was impossible. And I was just doing these things because I was trying to make exciting foods for my kids to eat it. So it's like, if I'm going to grow this and my kids are like, oh, I just want mac and cheese. It's like, I've got to make this the most exciting food possible. And then also it's got to be the best tasting so that my wife eats as much of it as possible and all this stuff. So I just, I just threw all that desperation, all that fear into action because I had no choice. I mean, it's like, I'm already on a dead end street. I'm a high school teacher and in, in Madera County, California, and my wife has cancer for like the fourth time. And so, yeah, it just, it just got really crazy. We're actually in the process right now of working with someone who knows how to stop it from coming back. We're, we're basically having to retrain the cycles of her body. And it's difficult. We have to nurse her through each section of the, of the, of the different cycles of her body because she has no thyroid gland any longer. They removed that. Um, so, and, and then I have Crohn's. So I, if I get stressed, I flare up, you know what I mean? I get angry, I get flared up. Um, if I eat the wrong thing, I get flared up. So it's for us, it's a, we're kind of like a cautionary tales, canaries in the for the rest of the team. <laughs> so I just became this, you know, this, this advocate because of um, how crazy things were um, for us in our life. And I, yeah, I've gotten to play with, uh, you know, uh, I've gotten to record with Steve Lillywhite, U2's producer, you know, Dave Jordan, who worked with Jane's Addiction, all those awesome Alice in Chains records. I even got to play on some of those Alice in Chains amps. Oh, my word, the ridiculous. But yeah, so I got to like taste my full like childhood dream and everything. But because it really didn't serve people and because the music that we were writing and sharing with the world didn't like, actually change the world or make the world a better place in whatever you know, way that you want to do it, um, it, it, it just it didn't do anything. It was really just about you know, being able to play music professionally. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's really funny. It's like we want these things in life, but the wanting that thing is not enough meaning and purpose to fulfill you when you arrive there. <laughs> so it, it's got to be bigger than that is what I learned and what, you know, really allowed me to let go. Because for years after, I kept trying to create new music and try to be somebody in the industry. And I'd be out there in the middle of, you know, the hill country and foothills of California, like writing my friends in New York, be like, hey, I, I wrote this new song. And they'd be like, oh, cool, Matt. That's great. I've got to go now. We're playing the House of Blues. You know what I mean? And I'm like, okay. And obviously, you know, the House of Blues isn't like crazy, like high level playing or something like that. But that's, you know, where I was and what I loved at that time period. So for years, that just burned me up. And I wanted to be. And then I, I think a silver lining is that my son is just like 100 times better a musician than I ever was. Like my homeschooled son just like burns me as like a kid. Like he's just so good that it kind of makes, you know, my whole dream and I get in my dream just being like, wow, you were just lucky to be there, weren't you, Matt? <laughs> so, so yeah, you know, I've had some humbling, you know, things. I've had some speed bumps in my life, um, some chipped teeth, some, uh, some missing teeth. Um, but, uh, but but yeah, it's definitely um, rolled off my corners and, and taught me um, what needs to what needs to be done to uh, make things really happen. To be a regenerator, not just uh, on the landscape, but in the community, um, to serve a, a greater audience. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was amazing, and you're a hero and an inspiration to many. And you and I. Uh, share very similar paths. I just picked up my nine year chip last week and <clears throat> it was nine years ago when I became an activist and, and this all began. So you and I are following the same path and are in very similar places. It's, it's pretty amazing. 
Wow, that is really powerful. I had no idea. I wonder how many of us, um, when we you know break those chains, just become these like beasts. And maybe someone hearing this is about to break their chains. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's definitely divine inspiration, and you are a divine inspiration to uh, permaculture and to uh, teaching permaculture to kids. Uh, and the permaculturestudent.com uh, is your baby, and you have this uh, this in, in book form, don't you? And it's now like translated in 486,000 languages or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, only six. <laughs> Only six, but there's about six more that are in production. I've got like Swahili and Turkish in production, but I've got Arabic, Spanish, French, Polish, and Italian. So it covers a huge section of the earth. If I can get Chinese in there, and actually right now we have um, um, we have the, the main language in Afghanistan, which is Dari being translated, and then they're actually planning to give it to someone in Iran to translate into Farsi. And as you know, these things are absolutely life-changing for people in all, in all these circumstances all over the world in, in many different ways, obviously, but it's rolling forward and it's rolling fast. What I do is I tend to share my books. So you can find my book, The Permaculture Student 2, right there. You can see it right there. That's over 400 pages. It's the first peer-reviewed textbook that is a global textbook since the 1989 Bill Mollison's Permaculture Designer's Manual. It is crazy off the hook. And the reason you know, I say it like that is because we expanded permaculture. We, we have ocean regeneration. We've got riparian wetland regeneration. We've got large scale regeneration examples now. They didn't have that in the 80s. I mean, the Los Plateau project, which went viral in China and actually re regenerated over 500,000 square kilometers of desertified land, we didn't have that. So we've got numbers now, we've got facts, we've got so much science comparatively to the 80s and 70s, and, and that's kind of inarguable, you know what I mean? Everyone kind of knows that. But none of the actual textbooks were actually citing any of the information, so there was not really much updating going on. There was a lot of like, I'm just gonna copy what they wrote in that book and not even cite it. And I'm an English teacher. I'm so, well, what are you doing not even citing your work? And for me as an English teacher and a researcher and someone who really wants truth in my life, if I can't verify where that little tidbit fact came from, I'm not gonna trust you. And so I, that's why I write out all my references. I've got my, my citations on there. I've got peer reviewers. Um, and that's why my online course that pairs with that purple book, which is free on my website, um, has over 70 educators. And my, my courses, you know, you've probably heard of permaculture design courses. Well, mine is over twice the length and twice the depth and breadth of, of a regular permaculture design course. And so I really care about not just making this something that we change our gardens, change our landscapes, but change our lifestyles, change our buildings, our businesses, our local communities and economies, our laws, finally our laws. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, I wanna share this with everyone. So I've got free books um, of all sorts. Um, I've got audio books. Actually, if you go to my YouTube and you scroll down to the, the playlist, I have that entire 400 page audio book that textbook that's peer reviewed for free there. And you can listen to it whenever you want on any device that you want um, at any point. So um, that's there for you, that's there for the world. I believe it's a human right to know how to live like this and that's why I'm so keen on getting it to K through 12 kids and colleges and, and adults too, of course. But if we can get this information into kids' hands, they're gonna be able to call BS on stuff like that when they read things, when they see things, they're gonna be like, no, 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 no. That's not the way nature works. Let me explain. Because these concepts are not rocket science and they're not brain surgery, you know? These things are, are, are human right. They're intrinsic to you and I. Like you said, it's like, 
it's it's it, it's it's inspiration. It's divine on some level because it's part of our DNA. It's literally coming from within us because it's intrinsic to all of us. So it's that communal aspect that 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 oneness that we all feel. This ties into it. That's why when we all get out there in the garden and work together, we feel this camaraderie and closeness and joy, all one and the same. That's why they're you know talking increasingly about having gardening. And farming be a way to rehabilitate criminals and people who, who have, you know, made mistakes. Yeah, there's so, so all many, about it. <laughs> yeah, there's so many aspects to touching the dirt and the nutrition and the minerals in organic farming and the fungi that interact with the human body, as well as the chakras. You're out there stretching, you're doing calisthenics, you're doing physical labor, and you're creating the food that gives you the nutrition you need to be awake and alive. And to heal your body, so that it's a it's a cycle that when you learn, and as you're learning, you're failing, and you're you're reacting, and you're using those principles, you're you're gaining knowledge, real knowledge that is useful for your life. Uh, it, it's so true, permaculture to my existence that the more I do it, the the less I know about it. It's that amazing. Yeah, and I think it even enhances everything. I mean, like, it's completely changed my my relationship with like my family members. It's completely changed my relationship to church. I'm literally going there and talking permaculture, and they're like, "Wow, that's just like this thing." And then I talk to someone else, and I just talk permaculture, and they're like, "Wow, it's just like my own religion." And I'm like, "It's because it's the commonality. It's the common thread in all of us." That we need that we live regeneratively with the earth. So your philosophy, your ancient culture, this philosophy, all of them, if they're correct, if they're even partially true, will flow, will lead into permaculture. Because we all want to have permanent cultures. We all want to honor the earth. We want to honor people. And then we want to go on into the future. Matt, it's been a pleasure. You're awesome. You're an inspiration. I'd love to have another conversation with you in a few weeks or months. Uh, if you're listening out there, Matt's an awesome guy. Yeah. Uh, he's got the free, both courses up on YouTube for free, but he also needs you to buy stuff so that he can pay his bills. So go in there and buy his books, <coughs> share his stuff online, share his information. Um, Cause he is an inspiration to everyone. And permaculture is the solution. It will be the solution now. It will be the solution in the future. It doesn't matter what happens. If we have a catastrophe, the grid goes down. Permaculture will be the solution. Matt, uh, thank you for coming on. Do you have any parting words? EMP. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's absolutely been a pleasure. I can't wait to do it again. I feel like, like you said, we've got a lot to talk about. There's this a huge overlap. Um, so I would just end with that. As long as you're on this path, you may be like, oh, my word. You just said so many things that I had no idea about. I feel totally left out or totally intimidated. Or you're like, wait, I understand some of this thing, but that doesn't make sense. Dive into the material. Just that's why there's an audiobook. That's why I have so many uh, sample videos from my courses online. Um, because I want people to just start. No matter where you are, there is something in your life that you're doing right. <laughs> and it's just start there, honor that. Be like, yeah, I'm doing permaculture in that spot of my life. And just start expanding from there. My silly, you know what I mean? Just like step by step, piece by piece, bit by bit. And you'll start seeing it, you'll feel the reward from it, and it will grow exponentially. And before you know it, you'll have done the whole food forest in the backyard, you'll have your water storage done, you'll have your food, you know, your food storage, and then you'll start working on that uh, alternative power. <laughs> hey, and, that, and you know what that does? That, that relieves all of your anxiety because you're ready. You're ready for anything. And you are self-reliant and self uh, resilient. And if you guys are looking for a place to start, start here. Matt Powers, the permaculture student on YouTube, subscribe to the channel and watch his videos. And then when you're bored, come over to the permaculturestudent.com and buy a course. It's been a pleasure. You're an inspiration, Matt. We love you. Thank you so much.
See you soon.